Thank you.
sound check. Is that all right for everybody in the room? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, good afternoon. Oh. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. 
Um, welcome to Silsden Town Hall, fantastic venue. Um, we're all in virgin territory today because we're live streaming for the first time. So um, I'm going to wave at everybody at home. But someone did tell me earlier it's not live aid, but I think it's going to be better than live aid. So welcome to everybody who's joining us online. I'm really sorry about the um, technical hitch with the link. Um, and I, I hope that you um, are back with us. I'm going to do some stuff for the people in the building today. There is no fire alarm expected. There we go. So I'm Sue, I'm the Chief Executive Community Action for Africa District, I better say that as well before you think it was this random person talking to us. I'll be hosting this afternoon. Quick housekeeping, um, the urn's on, we're going to have a break after, after our presentations. There is no fire alarm due, so if it does go off, it's out this door, turn left and over to the car park uh, across the road for muster. Please do let us tick you off um, our list. If you are then going to leave, just so we know there's nobody left in the building. Um, if you haven't found the toilet yet, you go out that back door, you go left, um, there's a di disabled one on this ground, and then they're up the steps and, um, and in front of you there. And I think that's it for housekeeping. Oh, mobile phones. If you've got them, please put them on silent. If you do need to take a call, uh, please just step out into the hallway. That would be great because everything's going to get picked up and streamed to people sat in their offices and living rooms and all that sort of stuff. So without further ado, thank you all for attending today. Um, this is the Keithley Area Network for around funding. And today we're going to be giving you some top tips. Uh, when we did our cost of living um, networks in October, the feedback was we need help with our funding. And we can find sources of funding for you, but actually sometimes what you need is that extra information to get your, your application just that little bit stronger. So what we've done today is we've brought together some people to help the whole range of the voluntary sector, the social enterprise sector that we see in Keithley. So we have a, um, Gillian with us, she'll introduce her properly. She's going to be talking around how to get your hands on council and government contracts. So that's separate to grants because there's some different rules around those. We know this doesn't apply to everybody in the room, but we are also recording this so you can go back and look at it in, in, in future years and go, oh, I can, I can go, I remember that, I can pick that up. So that's why we're covering contracts. We're very lucky to have Shahid here with us from Give Bradford. He'll talk about Give Bradford a bit and top tips for there. And then to bring that all to life, uh, Melanie Hay from Keithley Healthy Living is going to tell you about the funding journey of her organisation and how they've got themselves to be in a mixed model of funding. We're then going to have a break. Um, we've armed you all with a notepad, or if you didn't have one. Um, what we want to do is get through the presentations and then we'll take questions after the break. So if you need to, please jot them down. Uh, for those of you that are watching on the live stream, you can either pop your question, if you have one, into the YouTube channel. Or if you go to here for BDC, yeah, at here for BDC Twitter. Um, oh, they're there, not there. Okay, hi. Um, if you go to the Twitter account, you can you could go on there as well. So we have somebody looking at the YouTube channel will write your questions down there, and we have somebody on Twitter. So your questions will also be brought into this room after the break. Um, so when we get to that, we'll probably do one on the floor one online and that sort of stuff to try and cover those. We are going to collect all of these questions. Ooh. We're going to collect all the questions. We've collected them from our first round and when we've done all five of these, we're going to put together a whole compendium of what people ask. So what people ask at all the areas, you'll be able to find out what they asked and what they answered. And then we'll give you, we'll put that into a PDF and send it out to you in a couple of weeks. All right, so without further ado, over to Gillian. Oh, right, okay, okay. Hi, everybody. Um, so, I'm, uh, my name's Gillian Askew, and I... <laughs> my name's Gillian Askew, and I run a, a, an organisation called Go to Brooks. And um, I'm here with my colleague, Lauren, who is at the back today, and we're going to um, try and give you a whistle-stop tour of uh, local government public sector contracts. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, Bradford as an area and um, how to find opportunities in Bradford. We'll talk a little bit about what you need in your toolkit. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about how Go for Growth can help. Uh, I'm going to try and not to touch the microphone while I'm talking. Um, uh, 
public procurement contracts, I'm going to start by saying, um, can be, uh, we've had a conversation already, whilst I've been here today, quite complicated and complex, and they are regulated. So there's often lots of rules in place and, and a particular way of doing things. So as I'm speaking to you, if you're looking back at me going, what the earth is that woman going on about? Um, I'd really like some work actually from the council, but that feels really complicated. Please don't worry. Outside of this whistle stop tour, free of charge is as much help as we can give you to navigate that stuff so if it feels over complicated and confusing um, i'm sorry that it feels that way but don't worry we can help you through it if you want to do you want to take us to the next slide please so just a little bit about who we are as an organization so i'm a, a procurement professional by trade so i've uh, worked in procurement for 30 years in both the private sector and public sector so i've been responsible for letting the contracts that voluntary sector providers are bidding for and trying to secure for their own organisations. And I'm also a long-standing micro-business owner and I run a social enterprise working for the public sector. And I, and I make that point just to say that I've walked a mile in both pairs of shoes. I know how it feels to be a provider to, to run the gauntlet with the, the contracting process and I know what procurers are trying to achieve when they're setting out to let contracts. But I'm joined by Lauren, who is our procurement apprentice, and also another couple of colleagues, Jimmy and Sherry, that you can see on the screen. We are um, have got combined expertise in things like social um, impact, social uh, economic growth, uh, inclusive growth at local economy level, and also environmental um, stuff also as well around carbon net zero more recently. So these are topics that you'll be hearing people talk more and more about in public sector. And then we have a bunch of other people who work with us from time to time to help us uh, provide the support to the marketplace. Next slide, please. So um, first thing to say, Bradford Council, I don't know if anybody knows how much they spend every year on, on goods and services. Does anybody have any idea? So it, it's around uh, 450 million a year. So a, a fair old chunk uh, of cash in the Yorkshire region. Um, and every public sector authority is um, trying to uh, award business to local providers, micro, small to medium enterprises and the voluntary sector. So it's a really good time to think about the public sector contracts as a route to um, securing funding. What we see as go for growth is that public procurement have got all these aims and ambitions about trying to reach out to local providers. And the local provider network is not shy of talent. Uh, we're not shy of resilience, flexibility, we're creative, we're innovative, we're reliable, uh, but often the procurement process can be a barrier to entry. So what Go for Growth is trying to do is connect those two communities to help public sector procurement to be able to award work to the local marketplace and to help the local marketplace access those opportunities. And we're what we would class as an action-based uh, research organisation. So what we do is we build an evidence base of intelligence about what the barriers are. So one of the reasons that it's great for us to be here today is to be able to chat with you if you've ever tried a procurement, a contract in public sector or, uh, you know, local government, what you found challenging, what was difficult, what was easy, whatever, so that we can help the public sector to make systemic changes so that they are more open for business and easier to access for local providers. So that's what we do. And we there's uh, different ways that you can provider, you can um, access us uh, on a one-to-one -one basis if you want to, typically, uh, or you can come along to any of the events that we run. So we've got 16 virtual events this year, and we do specific local authority events as well. Our first event is on the 13th of February, and it's all about finding opportunities. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a second. But we've got four lunch and learns in March on how to put a bid together, if you like. So, And then events all the way throughout the year. We have a self-service platform that you can access that will help you know what you need in your toolkit and put those things together so you're ready to take part, et cetera, et cetera. And for procurement, what they get is us as a resource working hard in their local economic areas to provide that support. And in a, in a competition perspective, which is what contracts are, there's always generally winners and losers. And if you're unsuccessful in an opportunity, a public sector organization needs to give you feedback. And actually we can help you work through that feedback if you were unsuccessful to help you grow and develop on the basis of that feedback. Next slide, please. 
helpful. So I wanted to tell you just a little bit about how much of that we're doing. So we work uh, nationally, but uh, Yorkshire is our heritage land. So I'm a Keithley girl born and bred. I was uh, born at Airedale General just down the road. Uh, so Bradford City is my, um, it's my home local authority area. Uh, I moved away when I was 26, um, which is too many years ago now to think about. Uh, but we do a lot of work in Yorkshire, it is our heritage uh, area, and we do a lot of work in London as well and all over the country. And we have um, got 10,000 engagements, over 6,000 providers that we're talking to at the minute. And there are no closed doors in Go for Growth. On behalf of the public sector, we will support anybody in any sector of any size with any aim and ambition for growth. Um, however, unsurprisingly, the people who are accessing us tend to be voluntary sector providers or micro or small providers, sole traders, where actually resources and time are the most precious commodity. And it can often be quite difficult to find the time to work through what can be a lengthy procurement process. Next slide, please. So what do you need in your toolkit? Um, these are, um, I guess, buzzwords that you will see in, in public procurement contracts. Contracts typically last anywhere between two and five years, and the regulatory environment kicks in at 213,000, including VAT. Below that, it will be an under-threshold contract it's classed as. And so whoever your client potentially is going to be, in this case, Bradford Council, I guess, um, how they go to market will be on their website. So on Bradford Council's website, they have something called their standing orders, up to 25,000. They will be doing a local sweep of what's in the marketplace, looking really just for quotes rather than a full-on procurement process. Over 25,000, they'll be doing something different. But in all cases, these are the things that they'll be testing more than others, the higher the value of the contract. Um, Obviously, value for money, which can be quite subjective and will be different, actually, and it will be expressed differently, contract to contract. Public procurement want to know that the stability and who they award the contract to so that you can um, undertake and deliver that contract for the duration that it is live for. So if that's a five-year contract, that you have the resources and the ability to run that contract for five years. But they also want flexibility, scalability and resilience. And the, and the global pandemic really brought that to a fore and really showed the public sector that the local marketplace have got that in abundance. So actually, when the chips are down, the local marketplace is, is who will respond and who will respond quickly and flexibly. The next two things that are on that list, social value and carbon net zero, there's something called the Public Services Act, which was assented to law in 2013. And what that means is, in law, every one pound of taxpayers' money that's spent through the public sector, they have to consider um, the social impact at local economic level of that pound. And they will be testing that in those procurement contracts. So they will be asking you as providers, us as providers, what it is that we're doing that locally, socially impacts on the communities in which we reside and in which we serve. The voluntary sector, are doing that usually as, as core purpose of who you are as a voluntary sector provider. And carbon net zero, obviously, you know, if, you, if you're watching the television at all, we're talking about global warming. We, you know, we're in the middle of a climate emergency. So our government already has enshrined in law that if the contract value is over 5 million, you must have a carbon reduction plan. But that is now flowing down to much lower value contracts. So we are helping providers to get ready for the production of a carbon reduction plan that's proportionate to who you are as an organization and what you do for your day job. So you shouldn't be asked for a 100-page carbon reduction plan if you're a really small local kit, for example. And then innovation. Uh, the public sector not necessarily uh, finds it easy to buy innovation, but it is really seeking to learn and wants to work with local providers about what innovation can look like in the marketplace as we grow. Next slide, please. So I don't know if anybody uh, in the room, and, and I don't know if anybody who is also joining us virtually has heard of things called Contracts Finder. So Contracts Finder is a search engine. It's free of charge. It's issued by the Cabinet Office. Um, and these are live links. When the slides go out, you can click on them. They'll take you straight to it. Um, 
For central government departments, they're mandated to advertise anything over 10,000 on contract finder. Wider public sector, it's best practice to advertise over 25,000, and most do. Um, but it's a search engine. You can look for opportunities that are relevant to you in a relevant location, and it will take you to something that's called a procurement portal. If you want to work for the public sector local authority in Yorkshire and the Humber, the portal that you would access these procurement opportunities on is called Your Tender. And all the opportunities are on there. And we had a, a quick sweep today, Lauren, and I think there's nine opportunities on, currently on Your Tender through Bradford City Council, one of which is a market engagement event where they're trying to see what the capability of the market is before they go out to buy from it. Uh, but again, you can click on both of those links. Now, we do have our resident expert, Lauren, with us. The procurement portals, there's lots of them. If you wanted to work for the NHS in Bradford and the local authority in Bradford and the university in Bradford, they're three different portals. So you would need three different registrations and you would go through three different processes. But Lauren knows them all intimately. And one of the things that Go for Growth does is we'll help you do those registration processes, we'll help you find those opportunities on the portal, and we'll help you work through what you need in order to answer those opportunities. Next slide, please. If you click through five, to bring all five up for me. So over those 10,000 engagements, we've been asking local providers, what is it that is challenging you most? And this is what providers are telling us. Um, so how to demonstrate your value? How do you tell your story about what makes you good, what makes you the right person to be awarded that contract? And you might be one of many, actually, depending on the type of contract. But what comes up time and time again is that writing that bid, it can be time consuming and it is a scored process. So knowing how to answer those questions, as simple as that sounds, can often be a bit more complicated than it would uh, feel at first look. And when we can, next slide, please. Or maybe we can't. Do you want me to just carry on, Sue, without the slides? I haven't got my glasses on, so I can't actually make one. <laughs> yes, okay, I know, I can see those. Ah, there it is. So, um, fleetingly, what you saw then, if you were quick enough at reading it, um, you will, for every contract opportunity, there's something at the beginning of it called a standard selection questionnaire. These slides are going out, aren't they, Sue? So what you see, if you missed it today, don't worry, it's coming to you. There's something called the standard selection questionnaire. There are eight sections on it. Depending on how big the opportunity is in the public sector, it determines how much of that standard selection questionnaire you have to answer. But you'll always be answering some of it. So one of the things Go for Growth will do is go through that SSQ, Standard Selection Questionnaire, with you in slower time, outside of any opportunity you might be trying to secure, to make sure that you've got all your ducks in a row and everything that you need. And we can also help you get something called Public Sector Supply Ready Status, which effectively um, shows public sector that you have been through that, you know what you need in terms of insurances, licenses, accreditation, et cetera, et cetera, in order to, to take part in those opportunities. And there's a couple of videos on there. Again, they're live links. There's a tutorial video for how to search on Contracts Finder and a tutorial video on how to uh, register for the Your Tender platform. And that, when you go into it, is what you'll see. You'll see those opportunities up there. And you can click through them all. But Lauren will show you how to do that if you need to. Next slide, please. And if you want to click it through so we can see it, um, again, these are all live links when you get the slides. If you want to know more about public sector opportunities or Go for Growth or how we can help you, you can click on all of these and it will tell you a little bit more information about who we are and how we can help. Um, and next slide, please. And if you want to chat with us, you can grab us today. We're here all day. I've been dying to say that with a microphone. Um, or we've got a bookable calendar, so we uh, you can book straight into either mine or Lauren's calendar, the 30 minutes Teams conversation. They're all in confidence, so we don't share at a personal level what feedback we get from anybody, and there's all our social media channels. And I think that might be it for me, is it? I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Gillian. Um, I've meant to say at the beginning, all of these slides will be coming out to you in two separate decks after the event. So you'll get the go for growth ones as one deck 
and give Bradford's as a separate deck so that you don't have to have housekeeping and tea breaks and those sorts of things and you can get to, directly to the information that you want. So you'll get to, you'll get those on one email when we're done today. Um, I'm just your head. Thank you. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Hopefully you can all hear me. Hi, um, I'm Shahid Mulvey, Head of Grants at Give Bradford and Leeds Community Foundation. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Give Bradford, uh, the Community Foundation, um, some information about how you can potentially apply for some funds and also some information about potential funds that are coming up soon in the next month or two. So a little bit about Give Bradford. So we're a community foundation. So that means we're a grant making foundation. There are 46 community foundations in the country. Uh, so we're kind of one of 46. We're the largest independent grant maker in the Yorkshire and Humber region. So these figures on this slide um, represents just the Bradford grant giving for last So we gave out just under, under 800,000 pounds.
yeah, and obviously if you are working with children or young people, you will need a, a safeguarding policy as well. So that's an additional thing that we will ask for. Um, next slide, please. I think just some of the funding tips based on some of the applications that we receive. Um, it's not rocket science uh, by any means. Uh, we do like to talk to people as well. So we do always encourage anybody that's applying for our funding to actually pick up the phone and talk to us. If you're not sure if you're eligible or if you've got a question about a particular fund, uh, you can also book time with one of the grant offices as well. We have a system on the on the website where you can potentially book uh, a session, a half an hour session with one of the grant officers who will take you through any questions you might have in terms of your eligibility, your organization. You might have you know questions about your accounts or whatever. Uh, do, do speak to us. Um, when you come to completing the form, do try to be specific as well and don't assume we know everything about your organization. That's a real mistake that a lot of people make is uh, you know I might have I might have gone to visit a particular organization three months ago and then you know they won't put stuff in there which they think well you were there you know three months ago obviously you know so, well I know but I'm not making the decision that's the other key thing is that the foundation don't make any of the decisions we make recommendations to an independent grant panel so it's it could be you know somebody random that's on the panel a community member, a funder, etc., who won't know your organization. So they will judge your project based on the criteria and against the other applications that are received. So don't assume just because I've been to visit your project that you know I already know that information. Um, obviously do your home whoops. Do your homework. Um, you know, look at the website, make sure you do address the funding criteria. Um, surprising how many people don't read the criteria and then they come to the end and they get rejected and they spent all that time and actually it said you know your turnover has got to be less than a hundred thousand pounds in the criteria document and you're more than that so you're not eligible um, and obviously do your research in terms of whatever particular activity you want to do um, you know is there a need and demand for the activity that you're proposing to do um, you know what is the kind of added value that you're bringing uh, to the table that kind of thing is quite important to most funders um, have a proper clear budget which aligns with the activity that you're proposing. Sometimes we get a budget and it's all it's got in there is staffing and that's it. So it's got no other kind of costs in there about you know how are they going to deliver that activity, nothing about promotion, and it kind of makes it look unrealistic. So just make sure your budget matches up with whatever activity you're proposing in your proposal. Uh, be mindful of value for money that goes without saying, you know, the cost of beneficiary. You should look at that, make sure that that's affordable, I guess. Um, and yeah, if you're applying for multi-year funding, this is another thing that is increasingly important uh, in the current climate with the cost of living crisis is that sometimes we, we do offer some funds which are two-year and three-year funds and people don't allow for like increments in year two and year three for things like salaries, for example. And they just put it, you know, they put, they'll put 10,000 in each box for year one, two, three. Um, we do encourage you to look at things like inflation, not just on that, but also electricity bills and your overheads and various other things. You should be looking at, um, you know, increasing that as, 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 the, as the project progresses. Match funding is another one which um, people put in, they, they don't tell us where the match funding is coming from. Um, they'll say the total project cost is 20,000. They've applied for 10,000. So there's a gap of 10,000. But they won't, they won't tell us anything about whether they've actually applied for that £10,000, when the decision's due, if they've secured it. They'll just assume that, you know, we're just applying for that 10000 We don't need to tell you about that ten. So we don't know whether that project's going to go ahead or whether it's viable. Um, so, so that's quite important. Um, obviously, ensure that you do attach any important information that we've asked for. So usually we'll ask for things like the governing document, your accounts, things like your safeguarding policy, things, you know, so, so, so any supporting information, do always make sure that you do submit those because without that, it's incomplete. Um, and finally, um, yeah, the monitoring aspect, people tend not to focus too much on that, but we do appreciate people that, you know, submit timely and honest monitoring reports um, and, and create a bit of a relationship with us and create that trust as well. We don't want to just hear all the good stuff that's happened on your project. Sometimes on your project, it doesn't go as you planned and, you know, there's things that don't work out and there's some learning in there. And we're, we're quite keen to know about the bad stuff as well as the good stuff. 
Um, and it's, it's all about building that relationship with the funder. And we do try to, we're very keen to become a more relational funder. We, you know, we want to know about the kind of issues and challenges that you guys are facing on the day-to-day -day basis and any issues and concerns that you might have um, in terms of the delivery of the project. And don't leave it to the last minute. If you need an extension, you know, just ring us. <laughs> Sometimes they don't, they don't tell us and then, you know, the end of grant report comes and they say, well, we've not even started the project yet. But you know, why don't you come and, come and talk to us about it? You know, so we want to know if, if you want any changes at all, you want to change your budget, you want to move money about, you want extensions, you want, you know, whatever. Uh, do talk to us about it because I think that's quite important. Okay, next. So these are some of the programs that are coming up just briefly. Um, <clears throat> this next slide. So the Bradford Fund micro grants, we run this every year and it's quarterly. Uh, so they're not massive grants, they're up to two, two and a half thousand pounds. Um, but they are kind of unrestricted in the sense that an organization can get you know up to two and a half thousand pounds to work on their kind of strategic development work. So it's about kind of freeing up the time of that organization and the leadership in that organization to focus on things like um, you know development activity in terms of organizational development. So whether it's leadership, governance, looking at impact, or looking at the finance and operations or, or the purpose and vision of the organization. Um, so as it says there, it's open quarterly. So it's January, April, July, and October. Um, and it, it's, it's a regular thing that we run. It's two and a half thousand pounds uh, for organizations in Bradford. Okay, that's one. Next one, the Bradford Youth Fund. This is through Bradford City Council. Um, grants of up to £10,000. This one is due to open in June. It's obviously a while off yet. But it's basically supporting youth work activity in the Bradford district. And this year, there's a particular focus around active citizenship and youth voice. Um, and they've added this one in this year, which is around creating cultural arts-based opportunities in the run-up to BD25, the City of Culture bid that Bradford have been successful in. So it's about gearing up and um, you know allowing young people the opportunity to get involved ahead of that kicking off in 2025. So it's all about kind of you know developing their skills, their leadership, um, looking at so social action type activities for young people. Next, uh, the PFG Manjit Walston Home Fund. This is through the Provident, Provident Financial in the city centre. So that's where this money comes from. Uh, we've been doing it now with them for about four years. Um, so the grant size is up to £10,000 again, and it will open in July. Um, and it's it's mainly, again, it's focused around young people, um, and it's around kind of improving their uh, choices around education, training, uh, looking at providing edu educational projects, enhancing their learning, their skills, you know, volunteering opportunities, etc., um, and, and, and kind of, you know, just, just raising the aspirations of young people in the city. That's what that's what this fund is about. Next, and the Pears Youth Fund. So they're all quite young people related here in Bradford. Bradford is one of the youngest cities in the country, by the way. Uh, grant size is up to ten thousand pounds for one year projects. Um, the unique thing about this is again it's unrestricted funding, so you know you don't have to jump through very many hoops. You don't have to tell us what you want to spend the money on. You can spend it on whatever you want, really. Uh, but it is aimed at, um, you know, youth organizations. So you have to be a youth-based organization to be able to apply for it. You could potentially look at things like um, core costs uh, or project costs. Um, but, but it says there you have to be a youth organization, but your income needs to be below £500,000. And it's an annual grant that you get £10,000. I think that's the last one. It is, and then obviously when we get onto the Q and A on the panel, I'll be happy to take any questions. I don't know if this works. I think you've got to sort of swallow it and get really close <laughs> yeah. and personal with the microphone. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so over to Mel. Last run, and then we're, then we're having a break. Uh, Mel, would we be able to share your slides afterwards as well? Cool. Yeah, brilliant. So we'll send you three presentations. We'll break them all down so you've got them all individually. I suddenly realised that you've actually got slides. Our, our guest last week just stood and worked. <laughs> we're just talkers. It, it keeps me on track. Cool, here you go. <laughs> I can talk further, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Well, if you all talk forever, I'll be doing that at the back. Yeah. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. I'm not tempted to sing, don't worry. You just hear me speak, really. So um, lovely to see you all. It's so nice to be in person, isn't it, and see everybody. I know quite a lot of people here, so wonderful to see you all, and thanks very much for all coming today. So I'm just going to talk about um, my experience of funding and my organisation, Keep a Healthy Living's experience of funding, and really what we've learned. So I've been and managing the organization now i've been involved with the organization for over 10 years so i've written a lot of grant applications a number of contracts and had a go at funding um, a number of times already so hopefully i can share some of my experience today so i said i'm the chief officer of keep for health for living i think quite a few people know key for health for living we work a lot in partnership with a lot of other organizations which is fantastic and there's a great community in keepley with that connecting and working together so we're a health and well-being charity. We're based in the centre of Keithley, just behind the library. And we work with all population from 0 to 100, with all the community, looking at ways to support and improve people's health and well-being. Um, we've been in operation for 23 years. And um, we've really grown in the last five years as an organisation. We've really grown and really established. We've now got um, about 23 staff, a lot of freelancers, and a really good trustee board of eight trustees. So really developed, particularly over the last five years. So um, probably what you're all interested in is where do we get the money from? That is a question, isn't it, really? So where do we receive our money from? So we have a mixture of grants, which we've talked about today, contracts, which are the most complex, I would say. So it's fantastic that there's support available. That's really good. Um, generating income. If I had a magic wand for how you just make your organisation sustainable, I'd love to tell you, but it, it's more complex than that. But we do generate some income, and I've done quite a bit of work on that. If anybody wants to talk to me about it, and I can talk about some of our how we do um, raise income. Fundraising and donations. Again, not a massive amount, but we do do some fundraising, and we do get donations. We get some annual donations, which is great. And we are going to next month, we're just in the process of doing our first crowdfunding experience. So I don't know if anybody's had a go at crowdfunding. If they have, come and find me at the coffee break and tell me how it went on. So I'm really kind of um, excited to have a go at crowdfunding. And actually what I would say, we're going to try Aviva and Sport England. Both of them have got two really good crowdfunding out at the moment and they do a lot of match funding so whatever you raise they will match so something new for us but we're quite excited we're going to have a go at some business donations as well so we're just trying a few new um, ideas with fundraising I think oh sorry now uh, one of the other thing on the end was additional support as well as grants and funding there was a lot of additional support out there so there might be things like free training you no know, participate are helping us at the moment with some redecoration so it's not just money there is actually look out there for additional support and things that are available so that's fine so this is a question I probably get asked the most when people ask me about writing grants is how do you write an application and I think um, this is what people ask me a lot really we're talking about funding for me what really works is we have a team so it's not just me who writes the funding bids if you can find anybody a trustee a friend anybody to help you it's just useful to talk through your ideas and what you want to do I find that really helpful so we do have a team we have a finance manager I have an admin and project manager and we come together to look at the grant application and honestly that really for me really helps so one of the things that's a really useful thing to do is develop something called a case for support or just what it is is gathering good evidence for your work. So I've brought um, a case for support with me and I'm happy to show anybody um, at the break time. So this is a document that kind of gives all the information, health stats that's going on, anything that's relevant to your organisation. So if you're working with dementia, you'd pull all that in one place and then when you write your applications you can just tap into it and it's really helpful we work with an organization actually built and um, based in Silsborough to help us write that and a funder actually paid for that to happen so I can certainly talk to somebody about that but you can gather that information together yourself by getting good data sources so there's loads on the um Bradford Council website I brought some again if anybody wants to have a look at the public health intelligence documents so gather some data, have that in one place, and it's just easy when you come to write in your applications. More than happy to have a chat, share um, some of that information. I think Shahid said this, read the application guidelines, and I always reflect back. So if somebody's telling you something, use their language, really relate to what they're asking you to do. 
And often I'll get somebody to read it and say, just read that bid, read the guidance, tell me what I've missed. So you really are answering what the funder wants. I think that is really essential. Um, plan what you're going to do and understand the project before you write. I never just start to write. I have a thing, I have a team, and I actually think, right, this is what I'm going to do. So I'm going to deliver 10 cook and eat sessions. They're going to be six weeks each. I always kind of have the plan. And then once you've got that and it matches the funding, for me, it's much easier to write. Um, the other thing that's really important, it's not just about writing good applications for a charity to get funding. The, the funder needs to feel confident that you're competent and that you can do your job. And well, they will do checks on your organisation. So make sure you're up to date with the Charity Commission and your account submitted. You know, all those things, we've been asked loads of questions and you've got to just check and verify that everything's up to date. A lot of funders will check your website or check your social media. Are you up to date? Was enough posted 12, like was it posted 12 months ago? All those things they'll be checking on. You know, I've had I've had some big funders and I've had six hour interviews and really been interrogated. But all that's learning, isn't it? Because they want to know this is money. They want to know that it's spent wisely. And that should be there should be a governance and accountable procedure there. So I think that's really important. Um, so actually a little bit more on writing. I call it heart and head sandwich. This is just totally made up by me. So there's no um, whatever you won't find this anyway. But it, when I write, I give a little bit of heart. So that'll give some sort of a quote or understanding of what's going on with individuals. or um, And then the head is some facts. So I do a little bit of facts, a little bit of evidence. And then I might say, from well, our experience at KHL, what we see is people experience food poverty due to the cost of living crisis so again it's that heart and head sort of things i try and use a lot of quotes if we use that project before be clear and specific make sure somebody can understand what you're saying obviously basic spell check word count i am very fortunate i have somebody who is a really good editor so does that for me the word count the character count can be quite interesting because you can write on and on and sometimes getting it succinct can be quite a challenge um, I think you just mentioned this before, didn't you? Make sure your finances add up and make sense, you know, that they are covering all the things. Look at what's realistic within that. Um, get someone to check the application. Does it just make sense? Does it, do, do they get what you're trying to say? I think that's really valuable. Check you meet the criteria, which we've talked about. Obviously, keep to the deadlines. And good luck. So everyone laughs at me because when I used to write... Um, applications it was the old-fashioned when we put it in a, an envelope and we put it in the post i always used to give the envelope a kiss and that was my like good luck symbol it's a bit harder to do with computers isn't it but what i think it's sent with that intent isn't it you're really sort of passionate about um wanting that to work so so that's that one can move next slide please the other thing you might all be interested in i'm sure you are this is um quite can be challenging searching for applications so the search engine you've all probably come across you do have to pay for that now but we just um actually we emailed sport england about something and they gave us a um, three months free access to grant finder so you might find some funders who will actually pay for that it's different amounts depending how big your organization is but that's quite a good search engine to find what grants are available there's lots of trust and foundations um, search you can do. Word of mouth today, I'm sure people can share experiences of funding. Obviously, a generic internet search. The other thing we do is <coughs> I'm always a bit cheeky, so approach trust and foundations. So I've got a nice little document that tells them about what we do, and I just say that we're looking for a couple of thousand to refurbish something, or we need some resources, we need two new computers, would they be able to fund it just on spec with a letter? And a document about our organization and our outcomes and actually that's worked quite well a number of times so, so that's a different approach really to funding and um, i think this is really key as well because i we have learned so much as an organization and developed so much through the funders and funders have been absolutely fantastic and it's sometimes seen as a relationship where they're the funders where that but actually working with funders i think can be really constructive and really positive so many funders are really supportive and provide enhanced additional support. So we've been very fortunate. We've been funded for seven years now through Lloyd's Community Foundation, and they do an enhanced scheme. So they've given us consultants, lots of training, lots of support. I had an issue, an organizational issue, and I just um, emailed the, fun the funding grant manager and I said, can you help me with this? And he got me contact with somebody who could help us. So I think that's really quite valuable, actually. Um, I've got a meeting with a funder tomorrow about a possible uplift on some of our funding. So I think that relationship, invite them to meet the team. 
the doors are always open. People can come and see what we do, come in, meet us, see me, you know, meet people we're working with. I think that's really valuable to build that relationship. Keep the communication going. So we always send annual reports. We just did a lovely Christmas video. We send that out to the funders. We're always keeping that communication going. We keep that relationship going. And we've had some lovely feedback saying, thank you. It's just a great report. It's great to hear. And have that two-way communication to me really is helpful. Um, be aware of any additional resources, training, support they may offer. So it's not always just about money. A lot of funders will offer additional things. I've been, for us as an organisation, really valuable. So we had some funding through Power to Change and they gave us a business support officer for 12 months and they did absolutely loads with us, really developed us as an organisation. So I think it's that wider um, context to think about as well. Um, next slide, please. I think the other thing we sometimes think, yeah, we've got the money, that's great, isn't it? But we actually have to do something with it. We have a responsibility to do something and do it well because that's how the funding comes again, I think, when you establish that. So it's really important to keep clear documents and files as to when the funding is received, when the monitoring is due. There's quite a lot of responsibility. There's um, grant agreements. You, know, you need to make sure that you're keeping with all the milestones. Keep funders up to date if the project is not going to plan. Clear communication. This doesn't work. We've had a delay for recruitment. We always communicate and let people know. Um, I think obviously what's key, you know, funding is so linked to impact. The more you show your impact, the more you can demonstrate how well the organisation, how well the projects are doing, the more likely you are going to get funding. So um, be innovative use case studies, videos, you know, really try and demonstrate the impact. And I think that ends up really supporting you getting funding going forward. And I think it's also really important to be clear on your annual accounts, what the funding was for, who the funder is. It's just that real transparency governance process. And I think that really then helps with your funding going forward. Oh, and that's it, really. That was my slide. So that was a whistle top, really, of my experience. Happy to answer any questions um, regarding that. So thanks very much. After the break. After the break. There we go. There's a picture of a teacup. So just before we um, let the people join in us online, are we still streaming? Cool. Um, one of the audience members has given me this little card. Um, it's about a platform called Give To, how it works a bit like the supermarkets where when you get a token for it, because you've used your carrier bags and you put it in a slot, they give 300, 200, 500 pounds to regular to um, local organisations. Um, Penny is here, knows a little bit about it. If you want to speak to Penny about it, we've left some of these out here. For those of you joining us from your offices or your homes, this will be going in brief in Bradford over the next few weeks. So don't feel that you've missed out. Um, it is five to three by that clock. We'll be back here at about quarter past three for the panel. Um, we are we have got Big Advice Day coming up in June. Um, where Chris is, there's this whole thing of we're trying to see put on things that you want us to put on. So if you've got a couple of minutes with your cup of tea, please visit that lovely piece of paper and vote for what you'd like or suggest other things that we haven't thought of. And we'll be back here at about quarter past three. Thank you.
And there's me thinking you've gone to move cars and we've been running around the car parks of Silsden. And then the lovely gentleman in the front went, oh, they're just upstairs playing bowls. <laughs> so you were dobbed in. Right, are we live? Brilliant. Thank you, everyone. Welcome back. Sorry for the slight delay, but part of the panel decided to try out the facilities of Silsden Town Hall. I do believe there's a bowling alley upstairs. Um, we're going to move into question and answers now. For those of you that have joined us on the live stream, we haven't had, if you have any questions, could you please put them either into Twitter or into the YouTube channel? Um, because we've checked those over the break and no one's asked us anything yet. We have two of the team here who will keep their eyes on those. Um, we're on roving mics with the panel. Um, I'm going to rove with this mic, so I'll come to you so you can ask your question clearly into this microphone so the people that are joining us remotely can hear. Um, Jonathan, if you'd like to introduce yourself, we've expanded the panel to include some other funders. So we have... Uh, Jonathan, who's from Keith Area Office, I'm sure loads of you know about him, but he's here around Community Chess, those small grants that go out. Um, Mel, let's pick her brains a bit more. Bill's from the VCS Alliance. I'm going to let him introduce himself a bit about that. We've Javid from... And also... Yeah, but you're where... But you're where... Yeah, but... Yeah, but the VCS Alliance is the health system stuff that we need you to talk about today. And then... Javid from CNET and Gillian, the audio knows. So I'm going to get out of the way, let these guys introduce themselves, and then whoever wants to go first, stick your hands up and we'll ask a question into this mic. Hi, I'm Jonathan Hayes. I work for Bradford Council's Neighbourhood Service. I'm the area coordinator for Keithley. Um, we have one grant scheme that uh, goes out every year. Uh, it's, it's small grants, just up to £500. Um, to help organization, help support organizations with um, things that are going to help their, what they do, really. So um, that could be buying new toys for a preschool group. Um, it could be buying a computer. Um, those, those sort of things that help the organization uh, do what they do. But we don't fund running costs, so we won't pay your electricity bill or your rent or that sort of thing. Um, uh, so, so that runs every year, uh, subject to the uh, council budget. Um, and then we often have other sort of schemes that come out where the council want to um, they want to to see the money um, go to local organisations and be decided on locally. Um, so the the people that decide where our grants go are local elected councillors. Uh, for the Keithley constituency um, and so where there is some money comes into the council um, and um, the leadership of the council want to see that uh, allocated locally to local things by local people um, then they will often do that through uh, the area office as well. Hello. 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 <laughs> Very good. Um, yeah, uh, Bill Graham. I know quite a few people in the room, actually. Um, uh, my background is running community organisations, really. And a few years ago, I moved over to the Bradford area and started working with the Modality GP Partnership. Um, I joined the VCS Alliance as a trustee. It's an infrastructure organisation that works with health. And I'm also an associate with Give Bradford that gives funding out. Um, I mean, over the years, I've written loads of funding applications, and I've, and and because I got the reputation to be quite good at funding applications, I started to work for funders to help them design funding applications and make it easier for people to apply. So hopefully, my experience will be quite useful, and I can answer questions about how to access some of the funding around health that's available in the district as well. Um, so I can help with that as well. And if anybody wants to take a photograph later, I've got a, I did bring a list of some open funds at the moment, national and local. So you can get a photograph of that if you grab me and you can then have a look at them on the internet if there's anything you not be aware of. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Javid Khan. I'm the Chief Officer of Bradford CNET. I would have been around for the last 15 to 20 years. Uh, in the past, our work's been around community engagement, um, working in health, working as a conduit between the voluntary sector and the council, 
recently, I suppose, a reason for being here is we support the council and others' uh, grant administration. Um, two of the grants we've recently done, one was what used to be called All People's Grant. It's now called Community Support Grants. 1.3 million um, of council grants to do activities supporting older people in the district. Uh, we've just processed that. So some of you may who have applied had notification whether you've been successful or not. Again, it was one of those grants that's been way oversubscribed. 1.3 million sounds a lot, but in the scheme of things, it's not. Like Jonathan said, it's looking at constituencies, it's looking at wards, it's broken down. It's also one of those political sensitive funds that councils are interested in see what goes in their wards. But, you know, hopefully we've done that. We've also just uh, closed uh, another pot of money we were doing around uh, suicide prevention. Again, it wasn't a large amount, 80,000. But again, those unfortunate stats that's on the rise, particularly amongst young men. Suicide is, is unfortunate. That it's, it's pretty, the stats are increasing over the last year. Um, although, surprisingly enough, across Yorkshire, Humber, Bradford actually has the lower stats than some of the other, other cities. Um, going forward, over the next couple of months, we'll be doing some more small grants. And, and I mean small grants, they're only, you know, 1,000 up to 5,000 pounds. They're not large amounts, but there may be some work around uh, antisocial behavior, work around uh, knife crime, uh, some work around. Um, uh, visually impaired and disabled people. So just please keep an eye on our website. We will be um, putting those out fairly soon in the next couple of months. Here we go. Oh, got a bit loud. Right, so I'm going to poke this little microphone to people's. I've got a question starting here. Um, I know you can't see me people online, but please, if you do have any... Oh, he's turned the camera towards me. Um, if you do have any questions, please pop them in the chat box and we'll, we'll keep an eye on those. Um, if you could say where you're from and if your question's for everybody or a specific person. If you would like, it's up to you. You don't have to, but... Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Steve. I'm the Good Food Coordinator for the Good Food Shop in Keithley. Uh, questions sort of aimed more for like um, Give Bradford, but also to open to anyone for su so, oh, sorry, right, that's right up, for suggestions. So we're, what we are, social supermarket, so we consider ourselves to be one up from sort of a food bank, the next step for people to move to to help budget money and move on from us. So we ask for five pounds for a donation of five pounds to get 15 items of food, maximum once a week for about six months. And then hopefully in that time, we can help support them with um, budgeting, things like that, and then should be okay to move on their way to new supermarkets as normal. Fortunately, when it comes to getting grants, this five pound donation that we asked for, which is to help people sort of move on and budget, are not given to us because it's considered that people are paying for the food that we're passing on. But, you know, we're trying to help people move on from the, the reliance of food banks uh, that are using them constantly um, to, you know, move on. Because there are people that sort of then become, how shall we say, used to using you or getting the food parcels each day instead of hoping to travel, you know, budget for themselves and progress and move onwards and upwards. Thank you. Was, is question is how do we yeah the grants we get denied because obviously we see it's they see it as the five pound that we're asking for which is to help them budget is like we're selling the food so it stops any grants there and then even though there's a lot of positivity that come from what we do to help people move on thank you so shahid i wonder if oh this has gone off again was it, was it me? We're good. Okay. I think if it, I wonder if it's because like, this might also be part of the question. Sometimes you can only give grants to organizations and that will be seen as a grant to an individual. So maybe we need to un unpick that in this answer as well. Like I'm seeing that Javid's yeah. nodding. So I'll hand over to I the panel. Ask, obviously, I don't know how you constitute how you made up with your legal status is as an organization. I mean, that's the, the first question we'd be asking. If you're constituted to be a CIC or CIO or a charity, then you can use that money as one of the questions mentioned, uh, match funding or money towards whatever you're applying for. So I think it goes back to how you're made up itself first. Um, like I said, I don't know. 
to be honest with you. But that'd be one of the things to consider. Does it depend? Forgive me for supplementing a question to a question, and I'm supposed to be giving answers. But do it, we talked about unrestricted funds. So does it depend on the type of grant that they might be applying for as to whether that matters or not? If they're charging donations? Yeah, it kind of depends who you're applying to. Uh, different funders have different priorities, and some donors are more open to unrestricted funding than others. Um, and then, yes, the question around individuals always comes up because, by and large, organize, funders only want to fund organizations who are kind of a legal entity, basically. So you, you have to be a third sector charity or a not-for-profit organization or a social enterprise to be able to secure a grant, for example, from the Community Foundation. But that's, that's part of our kind of, you know, governance, if you like. Um, so we wouldn't, we wouldn't fund individuals. The other thing I will say is a lot of organizations do set up separate charitable arms. So they have, may have a trading business arm, then a charitable arm, and apply through those. But again, it all boils down to the funders' criteria and what they are wanting to fund. For those, the match funding oh. thing is is actually a good uh, good way around it. It's about how you present it, isn't it? Because you're actually presenting it as contributing to the overall cost of the project. Then that's different to you know we're actually charging people. Okay, thank you. Um, if sat at the back of the rooms, Chris Barker. For those of you that don't know Chris, he's the person that covers the Keithley patch to give you that governance support that these guys have just been talking about. So if you haven't met Chris, make friends with Chris before you leave. And um, yeah, he'll come and visit you. Uh, next question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alan Clark, the Lions Den men's sheds in Keithley and Brackenbank. Um, whilst I applaud all the uh, links we've seen this morning and uh, obviously the good work that's going on with those, what disappoints me is that this, there was nothing there for old wrinklies like me. So consequently, there's national evidence that says that a large drain on resources is old wrinklies like me going to the hospital, going to the doctors, getting dependent on medications and things like that. But there's also evidence that through the Men's Sheds Association, we have been evidencing, and it also applies to uh, get out. And um, it's worth talking about Talk and Thrive. Um, you know, there's a, quite a few organisations that that talk. What we do is we talk, but we also have the periphery of activities. Um, it's very, very difficult at the moment to seem to find anybody that's funding the older generation. Now, there was nothing this morning. There was nothing on the other day. The other day, it was all about um, Leeds, to be fair. There was one Give Bradford, and it was for up to, I think it was £1,000 or 5000 and that was closing a couple of days after that. So do the, do the panel uh, have any suggestions for organisations like ourselves who are currently being asked to move from Cliff Castle up to Wood in Keithley, and we're really looking forward to it, but it's costly. We've got to buy containers. We've got to get stuff up there. So it's it's a general question, but I'm I'm not seeing much uh, in the way of grant finding and, and stuff for that older generation, and it's been proven that it does reduce dependency on the national health service. Um, Bill, Bill, I'm wondering if I'm wondering if previously the um, asset based community development grants called ABCD grants that the Alliance give out have covered those things. I don't know. The ones that are on the community partnership footprints, maybe that's a, an answer. The, the ABCD grants are very small pots of money to try and get little projects going. I think what Alan's looking for is something a bit more substantial to support men's sheds. I mean, men's sheds have been very successful around the country. Um, I think the AWC grants supported one of the Wharfdale men's sheds this year because we got an application from them, Alan. I don't not sure you applied this year. Um, so, um, yeah, um, and again, it's that thing that Mel says. You know, it's it's. I think I think for organisations, um, because there's a lot of organisations out there, um, it's really incumbent on the organisation to to do the legwork to find the funding that suits them. Now, I've got some ideas here of funds that might help you, Alan, in your quest for funds. I don't know if you've applied to them already, so I don't know 
you might say, oh, I've applied to that or I've been successful with that. So I don't know that, but we can have a chat later. Um, and I'd say to everyone, I think there's, I, th I think we, if we go before COVID, I was always saying to organisations that there's a lot of funding out there and quite often it's putting the legwork in to find the funding that suits the projects you want to run. I think we then had COVID and in some ways it was a bit of a feast because there was a lot of funding available to help organisations survive COVID. I'm now fearing in the last year or so and looking ahead that we're now hitting a famine. So I might, you know, what I've been saying for the last 10 years that there's generally funding out there, I'm not 100% sure that's as much the case as it used to be. Um, so I would say that means you have to maybe do a bit more legwork to find the funding that suits you. But when I'm saying a famine, it's not a famine. There's still a lot of funds out there. There's a lot of open funds and there's a lot of funds for lots of different, um, you know, they'll have lots of different targets and priorities that can suit the different projects in this room. So I'd always say, like Mel says, you know, do the lead work, do the scanning, you know, use the grant finder tool or just put stuff into the internet and have a look to see what might be available. Um, and, you know, you've got that option. You've got local funders and you've got national funders. So always be aware of what's happening locally, but also keep an eye on what's happening nationally. So, you know, th there is a lot of funding out there, Alan, but, you've, you know, it's, it's important to have a good look around and see what you think might suit your project. Mel wanted to, yeah, and I've got, and I've got, after Mel, I've got an addition and then we have another question there here. There are quite a few specific funders for older people, Alan, which I'm happy to share. I know we've definitely got quite a list of them. And also, I think awards for all would be perfect for that lottery. Yeah, I think that'd be perfect one for that. So, but yeah, okay, brilliant. Just if, the other thing I would say to you is that one of the things we've noticed, it's really getting harder to work in isolation. What you do is really good, but another opportunity would be to look at who else is doing something, if not similar, but doing other work around health and offer your service, if nothing else. So it's working alongside them and see if they can access the funds. Um, Bill's mentioned Grant Funder a couple of times. That's now um, available in libraries across Bradford for you to go and have a look with Grant Finder. Sorry. Don't have to pay for it. Um, it's in your library. If you can't find it in your library, shout at Chris and we'll shout at the library people to make sure we can sort that. And again, if you don't know how to use it, Chris is your first port of call to help you have a lesson with that. And if that doesn't work, we'll get in the person that looks at our funding as their specialism. Yeah. that may not have heard that on the stream. Grant Fund is currently in the, in the library in City Park. It's rolling out to Shipley and Keithley. We will find out when it's arriving. You book an appointment. Someone takes you through it. So Chris is off the... And maybe partner to offer a joint grant that's working with both generational things to bring them together. Can that be done? So we. Sorry. Interesting question. And to be honest, it's one that we would really support. Um, but unfortunately, some of the grant providers have their own criteria, have their own outcomes that they want to match. So not all. It's sometimes difficult. Funders grants together, but what you're saying is is very plausible and is something would welcome and support definitely. We've done kind of intergenerational projects, bringing kind of young young people and older people together around particular topics and stuff. But again, 
depends on funder priorities. Uh, just, just another thing, Alan, um, I don't know if you've signed up to the funding alerts, alerts that we have on our website. So if you go onto the Give Back website, you can actually sign up to the alerts. And that'll send you an email every time there's a new fund launched. That way you'll, you'll never miss an opportunity and you can have a look if it's relevant and you can apply for it. I'm hoping that, here we go, I've got some battery now. Is there, are there any questions on this side? Because I got pulled this way. Anybody on this side? No, any more from this side? One more for this. Have we got anything online yet, Rach? No, anything on Twitter? That would just be an added complication. Hello, um, I'm Annie Barrington from Get Out More. We're a social enterprise. So it's, um, it's a question for Jill about um, procurement and adding social value to, to contracts, which is something we'd really like to explore. Can you say a bit more about how, how we find the people that are doing the, that are putting in the, the bids or how do they find us so that we can match mm -hmm. together? Because it's easy to find the contracts, but it's we don't want to apply. We want to be part of other people's bids. Right, okay. So you, effectively, you want to be in the supply chain, if you like, so second tier or, or below. Okay. So there is um, something called contracts register. So there's a piece of legislation called the Freedom of Information Act and the Transparency Act. And what that means is that public sector have to publish what their spend is and who they're spending it to. And they have to publish that. Bradford City Council publish everything over 5,000. That's in their standing orders. And it's on their website. So you could go onto the Bradford Council website, uh, look for the spend that's most relevant to your organization, and you'll see who the provider is that they're working directly with. And you can contact them to, um, to think about being part of their supply chain and their supply base. And I think that plays into that, you know, work with others, that sort of partnership. Um, uh, what every public sector organization has to think about is all the way through the supply chain. So the more that that can be locally based, the better it is in terms of that social um, and economic impact piece. So that's one way that you could do it. Does that answer the question a bit? I think I it. <laughs> it's on their website. So um, if you want, if you want to give me your details, I can send you a link or I can send a link to Sue that you can circulate to everybody so everybody can get access to uh, the contracts register, uh, we can do that. That's not a problem. If you send us the link, we'll pop it into the PDF we're going to give you with questions and answers because yeah. that question was asked at the last event. I'm sure it will come again. So we'll make yeah. sure you get it in that PDF at the end of at the end of the round of the five. Um, yeah, I'll do that. Perfect. Um, okay, it's 20 to four. Have we got any more questions? We've got another 20 minutes with these guys. Oh, there we go. Right, I'll come to this lady because she hasn't asked anything yet. Then I'll come there. If you've already asked and you want to ask again, fill your boots. But it's hard getting these guys all in a room all together. So let's rinse them. <laughs> oh, Mike. Um, hi, I'm Lisa Holmes from Keithley Photo Hub. So um, it's just a quick one regard for anybody that does offer grants. Do all of you support being allowed to do applications via video rather than written? And if you only do written, do you provide support for people that are dyslexic? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we don't do video, although actually we have trialed it with young people because sometimes they prefer to send in like a, a quick one minute pitch which accompanies their application form. So we did that on one of our youth projects. Um, we do have like example application forms completed on our website as well. So there's a resources section on the website and it's got um, one which is around project delivery, another one around core costs. So two different types of applications and it's all being completed by one of the grant officers. Um, and also you can call any of the team and you know they can kind of guide you through the form and provide that support as well. So we do try to make it as accessible as possible. Um, it's, it's a bit of a mixed mixed feedback. Some people like doing video, others not so much. So um, it was, so we had it as an, as an optional thing rather than a compulsory thing. You know? yeah. I have the capability to receive videos instead of written applications because we've worked with them to make that something we did before 
Um, the only thing is, but I would say with that round, it wasn't very successful because we didn't get enough instructions. So we got someone talking to us for like 30 seconds and someone else who after half an hour, we were like, <laughs> when does it stop? <laughs> so um, I know that that is there. I know that um, if Kerry was here, she'd be going, that's, that's something they want to start adding into the suite a bit more. But we just have to think about, you know, if, actually, if you read a side of paper, what that takes you like a minute. So actually, if you let someone talk for 25 minutes, they've given 25 times more information than somewhere else. So there's just some of that thinking through that. Around the dyslexia thing, again, feel free to run your applications past our team. OK, so we we do not offer a bid writing service a, across this program, because if we offered that, that's all we do. OK, but we will proofread for you. OK, and if your concern is, you know, I've got an additional need around language dyslexia or whatever, or, you know, English isn't English is your second language and those sorts of things, by all means, say, could someone read this for me and make sure that it sounds right? And we'll have a conversation and make sure what you think you've put on that bit of paper's on it. Okay, that's free. But you, you'll need to come with an almost done application. Jav, did you want to add to that? Yeah, all I was going to say was, um, we get so many applications. And look, the thing is, you get professionals, uh, professional writers, and you can tell uh, we have panels who will look at this and they'll look at something that was mentioned. It's, you can tell something starts from the heart. We're not looking at grammar. We're not looking at spell check. We're looking at what you're offering. So you shouldn't get hung up that you need to have a perfect application. It's not about that. It's having that idea that's really well worked up. You've got some good budgets against it and it's something that's deliverable. If you keep it simple, Sage, that works better. So, and going back to your point about doing it on video, I think it's not so much being able to do it. It's all about the process and being fair to everybody else as well. And it's also about how do you then mark that against a, sorry, a written application. So it's cost at the end of the day for running that process. But, you know, it's something that I'm sure going forward more and more explore because we're going into the digital world a lot more, so. I'm going to come around to this lady here. I'm back again, Leslie. With my little microphone. There you go. I'm still Leslie from Dementia Friendly Keithley. <laughs> my question's for Jonathan, actually. Um, you said local elected officers are the ones that will look at um, grants and decide Members. Members, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, how local? Do I have to invite all the councillors from Keithley to come and have a look at what we do so they fully understand about us, or do I have to invite everybody from the Bradford district wide? No, so grants that come through our office are councillors from the Keithley constituency. So I would strongly encourage you to invite all 18, um, even those that represent Ilkley, to come and see what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, 12 minutes left. Any any from this side of the floor? Any more for any more? Anything online? Oh, great. Okay, so we always like the gift of time. Um, sorry? Networking. Networking. Yeah, well, that's what I was going to say. Um, I'm not sure how much water's left in the kettle. There are fruit. There is... There are some biscuits and some fruit that need eating up. Um, or feel free to take those away. The far end's going for our network on Wednesday, on, uh, on Thursday morning. Um, yeah, so let's just use this 10 minutes to network, etc. Um, I would like to thank the panel for their time. It's great. It's been a really good opportunity. Um, thank you for joining us online. I hope it worked for you. Um, it was our first ever trip down this type of um, way of delivering our stuff. Let us know. Um, you know, please do let us know. We know we know about the link going at the beginning. Um, anything else? And I've picked up those a few problems with the sound. But any feedback you can give us to help us improve. Big round of applause to the guys at Sealsden. First time they've done this. Thank you for the lovely venue. Clap for the panel and then we'll network. And thank you very much.